Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. The Bible contains remarkable stories of miracles and divine interventions. Moses parted the sea. Peter healed a man lame from his mother's womb. Jesus drove demons out of people and raised others from the dead. But are these types of events still happening today? We too have a beam of divine light and guidance that God has put within the heart of every man. And it's one of the greatest proofs that there is a God. More amazing supernatural things are happening than we realize. This is Divine Intervention, the interview show that features intriguing people who've experienced the hand of God in amazing ways. Divine Intervention was created and produced with the purpose of encouraging believers, spiritual seekers, and skeptics alike that Jesus is alive and is still performing miracles and working in the world today. I believe in miracles. Here's your host, Daniel Fazina. Hello and welcome to Divine Intervention Radio. I am your host, Daniel Fazina. Check us out online, divineinterventionradio.com, facebook.com forward slash Divine Intervention Radio. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter. That's at Daniel Fazina1 on twitter.com. That's Daniel Fazina, the numeral one, on twitter.com. Very excited to be with you today. Friends, we've got an amazing story for you today. You know, on this show, we try to feature miracles, divine interventions, ways that the Lord has changed people's lives. And, uh, you know, we feature things like answered prayers, um, people who've been raised from the dead, conversion experiences, near-death experiences, all sorts of things. But one of the greatest and the most powerful testimonies, I think, is a changed life. And today we're going to be talking with a historical author who has cataloged in a beautiful book, The Changed Life of a somewhat notorious figure in American history, that of Mitsuo Fuchida, the Japanese pilot who led the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor during World War II. Now, some people may have heard of him and know about you know him leading the attack, crying, Tora, 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 as they uh, attacked Pearl Harbor. But many people might not realize the profound change in his life after the war that took place because of his encounter with Christ. And we're going to hear all about this amazing story and how several people's testimonies influenced Mr. Fushida, uh, such as Jake DeShazer, who was a U.S. Army bombardier and who was one of the original Doolittle Raiders who bombed mainland Japan after Pearl Harbor. Uh, He was captured and spent uh, a long time as a Japanese POW until he himself was converted. In addition to that, we'll be talking about the Covells, an American family of missionaries in Japan who uh, flees the country to the Philippines and how um, their daughter also impacted the life of Mitsuo Fuchida. So today I have the privilege of speaking with T. Martin Bennett, who is the author of the amazing book, Wounded Tiger, uh, which tells this amazing story of these three lives that are intertwined and the, um, the change in their lives that happens because of it. Let me tell you a little bit about T. Martin Bennett, the author of Wounded Tiger. Uh, T. Martin Bennett was born on Long Island, New York, where he spent his childhood before moving to California with his parents. In college, he was a music major, then a religious studies major, then dropped out of college, was a vice president of a very successful nonprofit organization with Keith Green, a best selling recording artist. He trained inmates in federal prison for seven years and co founded Premier Pet Products a company that had over 100 employees and went on to win a Presidential Award of Entrepreneur of the Year from the Small Business Administration. He's currently working on his more than 15-year pursuit, a screenplay about the fascinating life of John Newton, who wrote the song Amazing Grace. He wrote Wounded Tiger originally as a screenplay and then novelized it and is enjoying the book's wide success as it undergoes a second printing. Martin lives with his family in Knoxville, Tennessee. And it's my pleasure to welcome T. Martin Bennett right now on Divine Intervention Radio. Martin, thank you so much for joining us on Divine Intervention Radio. It's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks, Daniel. Not a problem. Well, I was actually completely enthralled uh, by your book, Wounded Tiger, and uh, when you handed it to me at the National Publicity Summit in New York, I was so excited to read it. And uh, this is a monster of a book. It's over 500 pages, and normally that would be pretty intimidating for me because I'm, you know, a slow reader. But this was absolutely um, an amazing, fascinating read. So I just want to first of all congratulate you on a great work. Well, thanks very much Uh, to people listening. It's got over 270 photographs. Chapters are short. I've had people tell me they read it in a single sitting. Uh, They (laughs) found it that 
you know, they just could not stop. I would not doubt it from the way it reads. It's just, uh, it's, it's awesome. Um, but before we get into your amazing work, Wounded Tiger, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and maybe your faith journey? How did you uh, first come to know the Lord? Sure, I grew up in a home uh, going to a Lutheran church on a regular basis, and I always believed in God. My mom would sing me songs, and she would tell me about the Lord. So, um, But it became personal when I was 13. I went to a camp in the San Bernardino Mountains in Southern California called Forest Home, not Forest Lawn, the cemetery, Forest Home. <laughs> and uh, they gave a gospel message and said, if you want to give your life to God, be forgiven and be friends with Him forever. I thought, yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. So I absolutely, sincerely meant it, and I remember very distinctly uh, being in a, in a row of kids, and they said, pick up a stick off the ground that represents every bad thing you've ever done in your life, and just throw it in the fire and say, God, please forgive me, I'm sorry, I give my life to you. And uh, I remember it quite distinctly. So for the month following that, I remember every night saying, God, you know, I still want to be a Christian, don't leave. I was afraid he was going to, like, check out and, like, mm. hey, this is, we're done with this. But uh, the next key thing that happened was I was in a Sunday school. We went to a Presbyterian church at that time. And the Sunday school teacher was talking about her father who had bone cancer. And they laid hands on him, and he was supernaturally healed. And they, the x-rays and everything said no cancer whatsoever, zero. And I Amen. Thought, uh, that was the first time I was exposed to God is here now doing stuff, not just the Bible is a to-do manual, do this, don't do that, and God will meet you at the end of the road somewhere. Hmm. Die. It was, God, the Lord is my shepherd right here. And I thought, wow, this is very interesting. So um, I continued to read the Bible. Um, when I was in high school, I went to some Campus Crusade for Christ conferences. I heard Josh McDowell and other people, and I really thought, you know, if you know, I knew that God was real, but I wanted to say, well, if God's real, then he's worth everything in your life, and nothing else is really, what's the point? You, you don't just focus on making money, but focus on, on how to serve the Lord. Um, in college, I majored in music. I wanted to do a Christian band. Uh, but long story short, I, I just found myself frustrated because I didn't really know what I was supposed to do. I finished three years of college. I was a religious studies major for a while, and I thought, Callie, I, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. And then I remembered the verse that says, Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock the door. Be open. Very, mm -hmm. very simple. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to ask God every day. What is it you want me to do? Whatever it is, I will do it. I don't care what it is. You want me to be a missionary in South America and eat bugs? I'll go to <laughs> South America, be a missionary, eat bugs. You want me to work at McDonald's? I don't care. I just want to know, what is it that you want me to do? I will do it, but you have to show me, and I'm asking you. And, uh, Daniel, I tell you the truth. I At that point, I was living with my parents. I finished three years of school. I was working a, a, a job, you know, making very little money. Right. But I had a tremendous amount of confidence. God cannot lie. He's going to answer this prayer. So three times a day, you know, morning, noon, and night, I would ask the Lord, and not a perfunctory throwaway prayer, but just, you know, really, okay, God, I am serious. Please tell me what you want me to do with my life. Hmm. So I, I prayed that three times a day, um, and, you know, first week, nothing, second week, nothing, third week, maybe a little bit of here and there, and then the fourth week, it was kind of like popcorn. When it starts to pop, you're going, was that a God thing, or was that just me? What's going on with this? So what happened was, I got a newspaper called Cornerstone. I don't know if you remember that. It was printed by Jesus People USA out of Chicago. I've heard of it. And uh, it was a colorful, interesting newspaper, and it was, and I, so I, somebody handed one to me in Northern California, and so I looked up on the list of addresses, I was in Southern California where I was living, and I went to, I wanted to get some of these, so it says if you want to get some, find the nearest address, so I looked up the nearest address, it was in uh, Woodland Hills, uh, California, and it was called Vineyard Christian House, so I call them up. I said, I'd like to get some cornerstones. They said, sure, you want to come to a Bible study? I said, sure, yeah, no problem. So I go out there, they give me a bundle of these papers, and I sit down in this house packed with people. I mean, wall to wall, shoulder to shoulder, and this guy with a moppy <laughs> head, curly hair, playing the guitar, singing, and then preaching. And I thought, you know, I've heard a lot of people preach the gospel and teach. This guy, it was way different than anybody ever heard. It was everything that was kind of the missing pieces of the gospel. And that was my introduction to Keith Green. I thought, golly, this guy's really, this is fantastic. So he came to me, and he said, Martin, I heard you know how to run a printing press. 
we want to print our own newsletter. Will you work with us? Mm. So I said, well, let me think about that. Uh, let me pray about it, and I'll get back to you. So I went home that night, and I said, Lord, is this the door you want me to go through? And before I could even finish the prayer, it was the Lord saying, loud, that's it. That's the open door. Do it, Martin. Go. <laughs> thought, Whoa, okay. Awesome. My boss gave him a week's notice. Uh, I ended up working with Keith. Um, within about a month, I was on leadership, and it, it didn't even cross my mind. I didn't want to be on leadership. But because I had some advice about how to organize some things, boom, that was it. And I became friends with Keith, and I worked with the ministry uh, to the day of his death in you know, July 28, 1982, when he was killed in a light plane crash on, on our property. I stayed on with the ministry till 1986, and then 1987, I came out to um, Virginia. So that's a quick overview of, of my story. That's amazing. And uh, for anyone who's not familiar with Keith Green, he... Um he was a prolific songwriter, and he wrote some of the most amazing and inspirational um, Christian songs that come out of, like, the Jesus movement, I guess you could say, of the late 70s, early 80s. Um, right. He's just an amazing guy. What kind of, I mean, you knew him personally. What kind of person was he on a personal, you know, intimate level? Well, first of all, he was very, very smart. He was very gifted. His mother was a showbiz mom, and she groomed him for music, and he was the number one selling Christian artist in the 70s and early 80s. If you go on YouTube, you'll see a video of him as a boy on the Merv Griffin show, and he was about, I don't know, 13. Wow. There was Diet Blonde. It's very funny. But he was the youngest person to be signed on with CBS Records as a songwriter. Hmm. Um, and he was, like I said, very smart. He, he rejected Christianity. He thought it was just a bunch of hypocrites, and he investigated everything else. He did drugs. He did everything. Uh, but he said, he, he in his testimony, when he shared uh, publicly and privately, he said he investigated Eastern religions and Buddhism and all kinds of weird things. He said, but they all said that Jesus was a prophet and a good man, and they, and they still do. You'll see that, anybody who investigates it. So he said, finally, when he got to, he felt like, well, if he's going to be an honest searcher, he needs to at least read the Bible. But it was definitely on the bottom rung of his list. So he started reading the Bible with a friend of his, who was not a Christian either, and they were both reading the Bible together. And uh, he comes to the part where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Hmm. And Keith said it suddenly struck him that everyone points to Jesus as a way, and Jesus points to himself as the way. <laughs> that was really a turning point for him to say, wow, he must be who he says he is. And he, when he became a Christian, he was extremely zealous, he gave it his whole heart, and he started running Christian music. But as a person, uh, he was a big personality. Anybody who heard him speak in public knows that it, he, he was very engaging, a very convicting guy. He was prophetic in the way he spoke. I got an email from somebody just the other day who said their pastor uh, had come to Christ as a boy going to a Keith Green concert. This was wow. just like three days ago. <laughs> it's he amazing. Had a tremendous impact on people, but... He was so dynamic and so gifted as a speaker, people were kind of in awe of him from a distance. Mm. But when they got closer to him, then they would see his foibles and his flaws. And they weren't like sins. They were just, they were, he was socially Quirks, right? uh, kind of clumsy sometimes. He yeah. would say things, he was weird, and it's kind of odd. And so people were like, God, this, this guy's really strange. And then you get one click closer, it's like, well, he's just a normal person like everybody else. So... He, he had very high standards for uh, what it meant to be a Christian, so high that when he would give an altar call, Christians are going forward of, man, I've I got to rededicate my life because I am definitely not who I should be. Well, he held himself <laughs> to that same standard, and of course it was very frustrating for him because he wanted to do, you know, be the person God called him to be. But eventually he came to a place of peace and rest in the Lord, which was beautiful. Uh, but... That was what he was like. He was he was a fun guy. But he had a tremendous sense of humor, very smart. Um, but it was a tragedy that he was in this plane that um, that crashed, and he died along with two of his children, the pilot and a family. You know, they were all killed in this light plane crash. Wow. So that was that. But I look forward to seeing him. And uh, anybody who sings the song in worship, um, uh, there is a redeemer. That was written by Melody Green, but Keith and Melody wrote it together, and it's sung in churches every Sunday you know, around this country, and I'm sure around the world. That's right. Oh, wow, what an amazing story, and uh, I'm glad to be able to speak to you, someone who's actually known him personally, because I used to play his music uh, during my 
Jesus Hour radio broadcast at St. John's University when I was a student there, and I loved his music, uh, the Redemption song, There's a Redeemer, the Easter song, all those. Um, there, was, there were so many that he had. He had quite a repertoire of songs, and you said he died at age 26. My gosh, what an amazing amount of work he did, had done up until that point. And it's great to yeah, see that had, people are still he being had impacted by many it. articles. He, you know, released songs. He really um, stirred up the music industry because he said, "If we call ourselves music ministers, why are we charging for concerts? You know, a minister wouldn't charge to give a prayer in a hospital. You wouldn't say my my dad's sick. You call the minister. He says, well, he charges 150 bucks for a hospital prayer. You'd say that, well, you can't do that. Hmm. So he said, as a Christian music minister, why am I charging money? So he stopped charging." And uh, boy, uh, some other artists really got angry at him, said, you're making us look bad. And he said, well, I'm not trying to make anybody look bad. I'm just trying to be faithful and try to do what God's leading me to do. Ultimately, he stopped charging for his albums, his his uh, cassettes and everything. Uh, everything was available, whatever he could afford. So all the years I was there, we never charged for anything, not the newsletter, not albums, cassettes, even videotapes. Shirts, it didn't matter what it was we did, it was whatever you could afford, and we just trusted people, and that's why we always did things, and it still affects me to this day. I, 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 I'm an author, I have the book, and people say, well, how much is the book? I say, well, it's 28 bucks, but whatever you can afford, I tell people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a... Take the book. I still do that. That's wonderful, and it is a it is a, um, a struggle, I think, even for myself as an author, too. I give away a lot of books. And people are always saying, you got to sell them, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, people do buy them, but some people can't afford them. And, and really, it's, um, you know, my book, Divine Intervention, 50 True Stories of God's Miracles Today. It's really about planting seeds and encouraging people and pointing them to Jesus. And your book, you got a big hardcover there that's, you know, 500 and some odd pages. It's a it's a monster, and I, I know it's not cheap to produce. <laughs> so I, I really applaud you for, you know, for your generosity in that. Let's uh, let's talk about your book. And, friend, if you just joined us, we're speaking with T. Martin Bennett, and he is the author of the amazing book Wounded Tiger. And you can find out more about it at WoundedTiger.com. Um, but it is uh, a true story of the pilot who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, whose life was changed by an American prisoner and by a girl he never met. And that pilot, his name is Mitsuo Fuchida. So, Martin, tell me about how you got on this uh, quest to dramatize the life of Mitsuo Fuchida, who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, a name that might live in infamy along with that day, December 7th, 1941. How did you um, pick up the trail of this story, and what led you to want to uh, dramatize it? Yeah, that's a great question, Daniel. So as a young man, as a boy and a student, I always loved true stories. I just gravitated to true stories. I remember one year the teacher said, you have to read a certain number of books in this class, I thought, oh, man, I don't want to read books. You know, girls read books. <laughs> so I went down to the library, and I saw this row of biographies, and that's all I read. I only read biographies, and uh, I've always just been drawn to them. So uh, fast forward, I wrote a screenplay on the life of a man who was uh, a transatlantic slave trader. He could have died on over 25 occasions that I've listed. I spent four years researching his life, and I wrote a, a feature-length screenplay of his story. He was at one time a white man in chains among blacks in Africa, could have hmm. died wow. in the 1700s. Nobody would have ever heard of this guy. But ultimately, he wrote the most recorded song in human history, the song Amazing Grace. It's the story hmm. of John Newton. Wow. Having written this screenplay, which I'm extremely committed to right now, but it's on deck in, in the future, uh, I knew what to look for on how to write a screenplay as far as structure and story. So I uh, had come across a used book from a defunct publisher on the life of Fuchida, and I didn't really think much, I didn't have high expectations, because I do love history, I know quite a bit, more than the average guy, and I'm, you know, I'm dialed into World War II as well, both Pacific War and the European theater. I never heard of this guy. I mean, never heard his name other than, like you said, the day that we live in infamy and, and the, he, that he led the attack. I didn't know anything about him. So this was kind of a thick book. I thought, well, you know, how can this story, I thought it was, well, it's just going to be about war, planes, bombs, ships. And then at the end somewhere he walks into a church, becomes a Christian, la di da That's what I was thinking. So I started <laughs> reading this story. And I thought, whoa, this is way off the charts. Why have I never heard of this thing? So as I'm reading the book, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, do you want me to do this as a screenplay? Is that what you're telling me? And to back up a step, 
I, like most people, I have a stack of books that I'm going to read someday. And I had a, a bookshelf when I was in my previous house. And I had finished reading a book. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? What book do you want me to read next? And I had all these books. And this one book, the spine of the book just stood out to me. And I really sensed the Lord say, Martin, read that book. I've never had that happen before or since. So I thought, okay, fine. But I had low expectations. So when I was reading the book and I was really, I, I thought this story checks every box for a very compelling, dramatic film. I said, Lord, do you want me to do this as a film? Is that what you're saying? Before I could finish the question, I just, it was resoundingly, you know, firm to me, the Lord saying, do this, get it done, Martin, get the film done, do it, don't compromise. Don't you love it when the I Lord does that? <laughs> so I, I thought, well, okay, so I figured I would, I would roll up my sleeves, and I kept thinking, if I was to do this the best it could possibly be done, how would I do it? And that was my motto. I, I kept thinking, okay, don't cut corners. So I spent three years researching the life of Mitsuo Fujita before I even began the screenplay. I went to, you know, read books, you know, dozens, thousands of pages, met with historians, met with authors, met with professors, went to Japan, museums, wow. everything. So um, I, um, as I dug through information, I kept coming across these little gold nuggets of information of, golly, this is... This is just unbelievable. It, no one would believe this. If, if it was fiction, no one would believe the story of Fuchida. <laughs> uh, no one would believe this. But it's true, and it's, oh my goodness, this is going to make one of the greatest films of all time. And I mean that absolutely sincerely. So I continued to research. I put together the screenplay. I had it critiqued and vetted by both um, script writers and uh, film people, everyday people. Finally got in front of uh, a studio. And uh, they wanted to option it. They had funding, which is over 100 million bucks, to do this film. <clears throat> but the big asterisk was they wanted full creative control. Mm. Now, I'm not a control freak. I'm not a micromanager. But I wasn't going to just drop this in the Hollywood pipeline because anything goes. They can change anything to anything. I thought, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. They can also and buy it, option it, and shelve it for indefinitely, which has happened exactly. to a lot of good screenplays. Put on the shelf, and as long as the option is valid, you can't touch it, so that's not good either. Right. I have an entertainment attorney who's a believer. His parents were missionaries to China. He's been in the film industry for 35 years. He said, Martin, the only way to do this is to do it independently. You need to put together a film fund of about you know, 3 to $5 million dollars and that way you can attach uh, executive producer, producer, director, marquee name actors, produce a line item budget. That's called packaging. Once you have that done, then you can bring in the bigger investors. It will attract those people. So I, I skipped that option, and uh, I, I then focused on novelizing it into book form. I thought, the movie is great, but the book has much, I can put much more information in a book than you can put in a movie, and a book has a much longer lifespan than a movie. Movies come and go by the weekend, but books, they stick around for decades. So I spent another year and a half working on novelizing this into book form, and that uh, I got a Kickstarter campaign and launched the book in 2014. Then I rewrote a lot of the book and added over 250 photos and uh, released the second edition on the anniversary of the Pearl Harbor Tech. That was last December 7th. I was actually interviewed by Dr. James Dobson for that, and then the book went to the top of Amazon. It was number one. It was bestseller status in four or five categories. Oh, I'm definitely not surprised because this book is very, very well written, very well researched, obviously, and I love the historical photographs. Um, how many photographs did you say there were? There's over yeah. 270. I've counted them several times. I think it's like 276. That's amazing. Yeah, I... Photos really make the story. Uh, I've had many people say, Martin, I've never read a book quite like this before, and I really felt like I was there while these things were happening because it was so, they just, they felt very engaged. Absolutely. Uh, book won a Book of the Year award from the Forward Indies Review Board uh, in June, and that beat out, there was, you know, they get thousands of uh, yeah. submissions every year, so that was a big thing. I'm definitely uh, not surprised, and um, I want to hear more about this. We're up against a break, but friend, you're listening to Divine Intervention Radio, and we're visiting with our special guest, T. Martin Bennett. He's the author of Wounded Tiger, a true story of the pilot who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, whose life was changed by an American prisoner and by a girl he never met. We'll hear more from him right after the break. And again, his website is WoundedTiger.com. Stay with us. You're 
listening to Divine Intervention with Daniel Fazina, and we'll return in just a moment. I believe in miracles. Hey, this is Daniel Fazina of Divine Intervention Radio. The Bible contains some incredible stories of miracles and divine interventions. Jesus calmed a raging storm, healed paralytics, and even raised the dead. But are these types of events still happening today? The answer to this question, as you will see from reading my book, Divine Intervention, 50 True Stories of God's Miracles Today, is an emphatic yes. Contained within the book is a collection of amazing true stories that attest to this fact. You will read the astonishing first-hand accounts of people who have been healed of paralysis, terminal cancer and tumors through prayer. You will see the love of God powerfully transform the life of an Islamic terrorist. You will witness the liberation of the demon-possessed, the resurrection of the dead, and much more. Prepare to be awed and inspired as you experience Divine Intervention. More information about Divine Intervention, 50 True Stories of God's Miracles Today can be found at www.divineinterventionradio.com or by calling 800-247-4784. That's 1-800-247-4784. Hi, I'm Kevin McCullough. You may know me from Fox News or talk radio. Have you ever wondered or pondered the idea of working for yourself or owning your own business, using your skills to build a vision or a passion for your own life? Think about it. No boss, no politics, no compromise, no commute, no employees, no discrimination, and no educational requirements. Just building something positive that impacts people's lives. Well, you can get started owning your own energy company for less than $500. Would you like to know how? It's through a great company called Ambit. You can find out more when you go to freepowernow.com. That's freepowernow.com. Or if you're really interested in getting started, call my good friend Daniel Fazina, an independent energy consultant with Ambit. He's ready to help you get started on a brand new career. 205-55-AMBIT. That's 205-55-AMBIT or freepowernow.com. Welcome back to Divine Intervention Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Fazina, and you can find us on divineinterventionradio.com, facebook.com forward slash divineinterventionradio, and of course you can follow me on Twitter, danielfazina1 on twitter.com. That's danielfazina, the numeral one, on twitter.com. If you're just joining us, friend, we are speaking with our special guest, T. Martin Bennett, and he's been telling us about his amazing and riveting book, Wounded Tiger. It's a true story of the pilot who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, whose life was changed by an American prisoner and by a girl he never met. We're speaking of Mitsuo Fuchida, who was a Japanese war hero. And um, Martin, welcome back. Nice to be with you, Daniel. Sure. So before the break, you were telling us about what led you to uh, create this amazing book and turn it into a, uh, a screenplay as well. But I want to ask you about the title. Why Wounded Tiger? What does that mean? Where did that come from? Yeah, so Mitsuo Fuchida, he was born in the year of the tiger, and he was a very, he had tremendous potential in life, and he chose to be a part of the military. He he saw the glory. He wanted to see his nation be a great nation. Uh, But in the course of history, uh, both before and during and after the war, uh, they were defeated in many ways. He was personally defeated. And one of the things that led to the war was the manner in which the Japanese and Asians in general were treated by the Western world. They wanted to be accepted by the Western world, that is, the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, France. They wanted to be a world power. But during the, um, after the war, excuse me, after World War I, there was the 
uh, League of Nations that was founded as a precursor to the United Nations, and the Japanese nation put forth a proposal called the uh, Racial Equality Proposal, proposing that all races should be treated equally, and uh, many countries uh, objected to that, and they said, no, we don't hmm. believe all races are equal. Wow. And the, the thing was voted down, and actually President Wilson uh, was in charge of that, saying he agreed. So uh, they really took that personally, and they thought, you know, why do Americans think they're superior and Japanese inferior? And he took it as an insult. So in that sense, uh, he was wounded by that, and he wanted to make a point, and I think the Japanese people wanted to make a point that we're not inferior. You shouldn't treat us that way. But I think uh, it's also... Wounded Tiger represents Fuchida. It also represents the nation of Japan. But in a, in a greater sense, Daniel, I believe that everyone is created with intention and purpose and potential for great power and beauty like a tiger. But through our own choices and the choices of other people, sins, we don't reach that potential. We're wounded. We're, we get hurt and we're crippled and we can't achieve our potential. And without some external force of healing will never achieve that. And you'll see this process in Fuchida's life. You'll see his rising star, all his hopes and dreams, then you'll see everything be destroyed to the point that his own friends are killing themselves. There's no hope left. And in the midst of all that hopelessness, here comes another um, ray of light, and he is restored to what God's purposes and plans and intentions are for his life. So by the end of the story, you'll see him roaring in his calling and in his potential in a way that God always intended. So mm. no matter what happens to you, whether it's your choices or the choices of parents or friends or somebody else that hurts you and damages you, nobody can keep you from reaching your fulfillment in Christ. No one can, because he's there. He is near to those who call upon him from a sincere heart, and he's a rewarder of those who call upon him. And that's what you'll see happen in the story of Wounded Tiger. Amen. That is very... Um evident as you read this amazing work, Wounded Tiger. Friend, you're listening to Divine Intervention Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Fazina, and our special guest is T. Martin Bennett. He's the author of Wounded Tiger, and uh, you can find more about that at woundedtiger.com. And Martin, you know, I think what you said was very um, poignant and beautifully said in the fact that no matter what happens to us, you know, whether good or bad or or whatever, uh, God does have a plan and, you know, it reminds me of Romans 8.28, where it says that all things work together for the good to those who love the Lord and those who are the called according to his purpose. And when you read the story of Mitsuo Fuchida, you see the events of his life. He had so many um, instances of what I perceive as divine intervention, where he should have been killed on many, many times. And he survives, uh, only to question why at the end of the war. Uh, can you tell us about some of those instances? I mean, there was the Battle of Midway and then and then Hiroshima. Um, tell us about those. Yeah, Anyone there's many of them. Those? I think for, for people to know is that Fuchida was not interested in Christianity in specific. He wasn't interested in religion in general. He was a nominal Buddhist Shintoist, but they were just kind of excuses for expanding the borders of their nation. But what happened was, it's not the, the sheep that go find the shepherd. It's the shepherd that find the sheep. And it was in retrospect that he realized that God was watching over him, doing him favors that he didn't ever acknowledge till later in life. So the, one of the first ones is quite striking. In the attack on Pearl Harbor, we don't think about flying an airplane over water as a scary thing to do because planes have such a tremendous safety record nowadays. But he was flying in a little plane with two other men over hundreds of miles of open ocean, if he had any kind of mechanical problem of any sort, that's it. You die. Your plane crashes in the Pacific, and you'll never be heard of again. So these planes went to Pearl Harbor. They attacked the fleet, and they were being shot at by anti-aircraft fire, which is uh, shrapnel, kind of these uh, bombs that blow up in the air and throw shrapnel in various directions. Well, this plane was hit a couple of times by this shrapnel, but they survived, so they figured they were okay. So he did make it back to his aircraft carrier, but after he landed his plane, his engineer came to him and said, hey, i got to show you something. He said, what is it? So he shows him his plane, and it had a control cable. It has control cables for all the different uh, surfaces in the plane. And uh, the control cable for his elevator in the back, it had been grazed by shrapnel, and it was kind of shredded, just hanging by a thread. Wow. And he showed him this, and he looked at it, and, and they both knew. If that snapped, boom, the plane would have dropped into the Pacific Ocean we wouldn't be having this conversation. I mean, the, we would have never heard of this guy. Wow. Well, 
they looked at each other, and his engineer said, you know, the gods are with you. You know, something out there, they're protecting you. And they're like, wow, that's great. If, it was, if that was the only thing that happened to him, you could just say it was a coincidence, because, you know, people dodge bullets and don't get in car accidents and stuff. But this kind of thing happened to him over and over and over. Uh, in the Battle of Midway, he was right in the middle of it. He was actually selected to lead the attack on Midway, but uh, he has suffered appendicitis, and that appendicitis ultimately saved his life because many people died who were in the air battle, and uh, he ended up getting transferred to another ship. That saved his life. He, he ended up uh, having broken ankles, uh, so he couldn't fly a plane. Well, most of the pilots were dead by the end of the war. He didn't fly planes, so he, that again, preserved his life. But one of the most dramatic things was he was stationed in Hiroshima, which was a war city who had a lot of military bases, and they were making plans for the expected invasion by the Allies. And Fuchida was there for these big meetings, and he was there for days and days and days. Then he gets a phone call, and they said, hey, we need you up north, jump in a plane, get up here. So he leaves the meeting, gets in a plane. The very next day was August 6th. The entire city is incinerated by the first use of an atomic bomb in war. Mm. All his friends were killed. His uh, hotel was vaporized. Uh, it, it just it disappeared. So, so the then, day before the bomb drops, he gets a call. The day before he gets a phone <laughs> call. Then, he, then they say, we want you to go down there to examine what kind of bomb it was and look at the damage. So he gets in a plane and flies back to Hiroshima the day, um, the day after the bomb was dropped, and he ends up walking around through this radioactive rubble for three days. You know, there's all what they call fallout in the air, in the in the ash, in the dust, and atmosphere. So uh, he examined the whole thing, and it was a, a, a very traumatic experience for him. You know, we see pictures of rubble. Uh, I have seen many pictures of rubble of of the the results of the atomic blast. That's not what he saw. He saw tens of thousands of burned bodies, mm. people still barely alive. The rivers, they call it a city of rivers, they said the rivers were just loaded with dead bodies, so many that they said you could walk from one edge to the other walking across bodies. Oh. It was a horrible nightmare scene, and he was there. So then about a month after that, uh, the doctors wanted to examine him. They wanted him to come back to Hiroshima, and he said, why? They said, just come down, we want to examine you. So he goes down there, and he said, what's this about? And they said, well, everybody on your team, they're all dying. Their hair's falling out, red patches on their skin, gums bleeding, and they were suffering from what they referred to as radiation sickness. Well, he didn't have any radiation sickness. No, wow. No, no consequences whatsoever. So he's walking around the day after the bomb drops for three days in the middle of fallout and gets no sickness. Nothing. So That is amazing. I mean, you think that was God's on, hand? <laughs> Right. Protection so on him? He was really, he looked at his life and he, you know, he was really, he helped lead his nation into absolute hopelessness and destruction and despair and poverty and really, and he, he felt horrible about himself and all he could think is, why have I done this? You know, I've spent my life helping, wanting to, my country to be great, now I've destroyed my nation. What mm. have I done? And he started thinking, you know, why am I still alive? And I think uh, everybody needs to get to that question, why are you here? Right. He started looking at these things that happened to him. This is where we start seeing these other, there's really three stories in the story of, of Wounded Tiger. Mitsuo Fujita is only half of it. About 30% of the story is a guy named Jake DeShazer, who is an American um, farmer, and he ended up volunteering for the U U.S. Army Air Corps. That was the precursor to the Air Force. He was on the Doolittle Raid. He ends up becoming a prisoner of war in Japan. His storyline is in there. Then there's a family called the Covells. They were teachers and missionaries in Japan. They fled to the Philippines when the Japanese were ramping up for war, and they later sent their children to the United States to continue their education. So without giving away the story, there's a girl, their daughter, named Peggy Covell. She was a college student in upstate New York, and what I want your um, listeners to know is that she was just a very ordinary young lady who loved the Lord, and she, had, she made simple choices to serve other people, and through her simple choices, just to serve God and others, the Lord did a monumental task of shaking Fuchida's life from head to toe. 5,000 miles away across the Pacific Ocean, his life was changed, and never in a million years would she have ever imagined her life would have a, a 
earth-shattering impact on the leader of the pilot who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, and ultimately through her life and through the life of this guy, Jake DeShazer, who was a bombardier, through these two lives, his life was transformed. But the way it happens, you have to see it to believe it, and that's what you get in the story of Wounded Tiger. Amen. <laughs> it is an amazing story. And friend, if you've uh, read my book, Divine Intervention, 50 True Stories of God's Miracles Today, you might notice and remember that an abridged version of Jake DeShazer's testimony is contained in there. I was... Um, fortunate enough to be in touch with um, Carol DeShazer Dixon, who is Jake DeShazer's daughter, and she and her family gave me permission to include Jake's testimony in this um, in my book. And then in Wounded Tiger, you see how uh, Jake's testimony of going from you know being full of hate and wanting to kill all Japanese and being a prisoner of war for, uh, gosh, I think he was over two and a half years, um, how God changed his life and, and helped him to really get a new heart and have develop a love for the Japanese people. He went back to be a missionary in Japan afterwards, but his testimony was written on a pamphlet form and distributed all throughout Japan after the war, and that's one of the things that Mitsuo Fuchida got his hands on and started to to make him think and question, you know, things about about God and he was intrigued by this former POW who came back to Japan to love his enemies and and I think the story of of the Covells too, Peggy Covell and how just simple choices to love others and serve others, you just never know how those ripple effects are going to you know, go out into the world and affect other people. So um, I just want to encourage you that you, you, know, you may be working in a situation where just trying to serve the Lord and you may not uh, realize the full impact of your acts on, on the world and other people and how they uh, you know, can actually lead to great changes in the world. So I want to encourage you to keep that up if you're doing that. Um, Martin, I want to ask you also, um, you know, there's been a lot of historical books out there, and um, I, I want to ask you, what do you think sets Wounded Tiger apart from other World War II books or historical books of this kind? Well, it is very different than other war stories. First of all, it's not written in the format of nonfiction. Nonfiction format is this happened, this happened, this happened, they said this, they went there. Uh, the way I wrote it was in the format of a novel, of its dynamic, it's all happening now with live dialogue. So the format's referred to as a nonfiction novel. And uh, for anybody who's read the story of In Cold Blood by Truman Capote, that's what he did. He took a true story, but he wrote it in the format of fiction, so it's very dynamic and you feel like you're there. The second thing is it's a character driven story. Most. Uh, history books are strategy. They're, they're big picture stories. They, they talk about, for example, you know, Pearl Harbor would be about bombs, planes, and ships, and all that kind of stuff. It's mm -hmm. very interesting to a certain number of people, but some people love it, and I'm one of those people who I do like all that kind of stuff. But this is very much of a character-driven story. There's three primary plot lines, and each one of these stories is driven forward by a set of actions. So they say a good story is like a set of dominoes. Once the first domino falls, it just inevitably leads to the next domino. Boom, 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 boom. And you just want to know what happens. So it's a character-driven story. It's also a rewarding story. Uh, uh, I can't tell you who lives or dies. It being a true story, I couldn't control that. But at the end of the story, it's a very rewarding ending. I've had people who are not believers, not Christian, not religious. They do not go to church, have no interest whatsoever, have read Wounded Tiger front to back and tell me they really, really enjoyed the story. They read it more than once. Had a woman tell me in tears, this is a complete non-Christian, she said, Martin, this story has really affected my life deeply. I really feel like I need to be a better person. Uh, I later gave her a New Testament, and she was very grateful for it, and we're still friends to this day. It wasn't like I gave her some kind of offensive Jesus tract. It was something that's real, authentic, genuine, and uh, love is the uh, the driving force in the story, and nobody really has an objection of people loving their enemies. So, yes, it's a Christian story, but it's not a in-your-face Christian story. It's just an authentic, real, genuine story that uh, I've found it to be broadly appealing. And, uh, uh, you know, women especially sometimes say, hey, you know, war stories, that's really not my thing about planes and ships and all. I said, listen, it's a character-driven story. Read five, ten pages. If you don't like it, no problem. But I've had female after female say, Martin, I never thought I would like a book like this, but this is absolutely an extraordinary story. I found it very difficult to put it down. 
Yeah, I uh, I concur definitely because uh, I'm not really um, one to read novels. I don't um, typically do that. I do like history, but I think this was maybe the first historical novel I've ever read. But it does read like a novel. I mean, it's character driven, like you said, and it is so descriptive and so engaging. I mean, the Battle of Midway when you describe what happened there. I mean, I felt like I was really there. Um, just a tremendous, tremendous scene in that yeah, one. So I had a. An English teacher. It was a friend. It was my daughter's English teacher, and she said, "Dad, you got to give it to her. She would love this book." So I gave her a copy. This was before it was published, and I asked her if she'd critique it. And she was very, very, very hesitant. She goes, "Well, you know, self-published books. You know, I, I don't think so." I said, "Well, just read a few pages and let me know." So I gave it to her. Uh, she read the manuscript three times, cover to cover. And she said, Martin, i got to tell you, I, I don't like this kind of story, you know, war stories, but this was very different. It was just a character story. And she said, uh, another thing, she said, when it came to the Battle of Midway, she said, Martin, honestly, i got to tell you, I dreaded reading the Battle of Midway. I'm not interested in battles. She said, but I found myself absolutely engrossed the whole way through because I felt like, like you just said, I was there with Pachita experiencing what he was going through and I found it absolutely enthralling. So I think for those reasons, and plus it's not the Japanese perspective. We've always seen the black and white footage of the day that we'll live in infamy. Mm-hmm. As a, I remember in high school, I'm thinking, well, what the heck were, were these guys thinking? They're going to take over the United States, some island across the Pacific. That doesn't make any logical sense. But I never really knew what were they thinking. What was their motivation? And that was one of the things I really wanted to nail down. So once I had a good working understanding of, oh, I get what's going on, then I wove that into the story so we knew what their motives were in such a way that the reader might not say I agree with them, but the reader would say, you know what, if I was that person in that circumstances with that knowledge and information, I can see myself participating the way they did. Right. Not justifying, but at least understanding and empathizing. So that was part of the goals. But it is an engrossing story. I had another person tell me, oh, Martin, I don't read fat books. She was actually a, an interviewer like you. Hey, that's like me. Yeah, we don't have time for that. I mean, give, <laughs> us, give us a short I book, said, you know. <laughs> about, I said, listen, flip through the first few pages, flip through, just get a feel for the story, done. You don't need to read the book. She said, fine. So two days before the interview, she sent me an email. She said, Martin, I sat down on Saturday morning to flip through the book. She said, I didn't get out of my chair for six hours. I finished the book. I couldn't <laughs> stop reading the story. It's an unbelievable story. Yeah, it, it surely is. Friend, you're listening to Divine Intervention Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Fazina, and our special guest is Martin Bennett. We're talking about his amazing and gripping work, Wounded Tiger, a true story, the pilot who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, whose life was changed by an American prisoner and by a girl he never met. You can find more about it on WoundedTiger.com. Now, Martin, I want to talk to you a little bit about the... Um, Actual, the research that you did, because there was a three years' worth. I mean, you went to Japan, you talked to Fujita's daughter and, and others, and how did you, like, were you able to talk to some survivors who knew him, and how did you get inside his head? Because a lot of it, you know, you talk about motivations and what he was thinking and, and saying and stuff like that. How did you come across that information? Well, information about what happened was not that hard to find, but why it happened was difficult, and what Fujita was thinking and feeling and believing, that was even more difficult. And I found it extraordinarily difficult because, one, Japanese people in general are not very open about what is going on inside them. They're, they're generally much more private than Americans are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Fuchida, even in his memoirs, he shares a lot of things, but his internal thoughts and feelings were not, were not you know, evident. So it took a lot of work, and I had to kind of almost extrapolate what he was thinking and what he was feeling. I did interview you know, as many people as close to Fuchida and the other main characters of the story as I could, and uh, uh, Peggy Covell was extraordinarily difficult because she didn't want any publicity for the things that she did, and she was uh, she had her own element of fame after the war, but she declined all interviews. I too couldn't find anything of hers other than a couple of letters that I, I obtained. Hmm. So I had to ask the Lord for wisdom, knowledge, and guidance. But what happened was, after I finished the manuscript, the first manuscript of the book, a contact of mine who knew Fuchida well gave a copy of the book to uh, Fuchida's daughter, Miyako Fuchida. And I was really on pins and needles about this because I was looking forward to her feedback, but I dreaded her saying, 
Martin, you've got it all wrong. Hmm. Dad wasn't anything like that. Because <laughs> how would I know? I, I don't speak a word of Japanese. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to figure this story out. Right. So I didn't hear anything back from her for about six months, which was not encouraging to me. <laughs> but I finally did get an email from her, which was quite long. And I now use part of that in the endorsements of the book on the dust jacket. So she said, Martin, I, I could so much sense my father in this book. I could feel his spirit coming through the pages. That You absolutely captured my father. And I thought, my goodness, I just breathed a sigh of relief. She said, I love so many of these passages. She said she loved the tiger. He was born in the year of the tiger. He was a tiger. She said, You've just got it right straight down the line. I thought I, I was just rather shocked and surprised, but, but relieved. And all I can say is the Lord was faithful to lead and guide where he, where he directs you, he will be with you. Amen. That's that what is, happened. That is awesome. We just got a couple of minutes left, Martin, but uh, last question for you before we wrap up. Uh, what do you hope that people take away from Wounded Tiger when they read it? Yeah, the biggest thing they can take away is that God's a rewarder of those who seek him. You, know, you ask and you'll receive, seek, you'll find, knock, the door will be open. God cares about people. The book's been translated into Japanese, and I believe that it'll be, the story as a, as a book and as a film will be a catalyst to have people ask themselves the questions, I wonder if God could work in my life the way he did in their lives, and the answer is yes, he can. And what Fujita did was he started reading the Bible on his own. He didn't go to any church. He had no mentors, no counselors, nothing. If you say, God, whoever you are, whatever you are out there, I want to know, he will answer, and he will do it in a resounding, beautiful way. He's a rewarder of those who seek him. Amen. Well, Martin Bennett, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to uh, share with us not only your testimony, but this amazing story behind Wounded Tiger, the novel. Uh, again, it's Wounded Tiger, a true story, the pilot who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, whose life was changed by an American prisoner and by a girl he never met. You can find more on WoundedTiger.com. Martin Bennett, thank you so much, sir. Thanks for having me on, Daniel. Oh, it's my pleasure. Take care and God bless. You've been listening to Divine Intervention with your host, Daniel Fazina. You can email Daniel at divineintervention at mail.com. That's divineintervention at mail.com. All programs of Divine Intervention are available online at divineinterventionradio.com. That's divineinterventionradio.com. Join us next time here on Divine Intervention. I believe in miracles. Hi, I'm Kevin McCullough. You may know me from Fox News or talk radio. Have you ever wondered or pondered the idea of working for yourself or owning your own business, using your skills to build a vision or a passion for your own life? Think about it. No boss, no politics, no compromise, no commute, no employees, no discrimination, and no educational requirements. Just building something positive that impacts people's lives. Well, you can get started owning your own energy company for less than $500. Would you like to know how? It's through a great company called Ambit. You can find out more when you go to freepowernow.com. That's freepowernow.com. Or if you're really interested in getting started, call my good friend Daniel Fazina, an independent energy consultant with Ambit. He's ready to help you get started on a brand new career. 205-55-AMBIT. That's 205-55-AMBIT or freepowernow.com. Divine Intervention welcomes the support of Letirzo Associates, Certified Public Accountants. Letirzo Associates, Certified Public Accountants, is a family-owned and operated Christian business serving their clients with quality accounting services for over 40 years. Offering full-service accounting for any type of business, large or small, in any state of the union. Letirzo Associates, Certified Public Accountants, 12 Oak Street, Number 5, West Hampton Beach, New York, 11978. Phone 631-288-3334. That's 631-288-3334.